favorite speakers, who happens to be rerunning for the office of Gila County Attorney. You know him as Bradley Bochamp. And here he comes. Yay. Yay, Bradley. So he's going to tell you tonight mostly about current events. He does not have a Republican challenger, so we don't have to worry about the primary for him. So do you have a Democrat challenger? No. No. He has no challenger. So we can just enjoy all the good things he has to say. There you go. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. If all I right, use that, I'm going to blast everybody out of the room. I'll guarantee you. You have to because so, be Yeah, you have well, to. If I, I, it's going to be, be tough. Just hold it all right. further away. Um, well, there's a lot of things going on in yep. the world. <laughs> I was listening to a little bit of the speech, and, and uh, what struck me as interesting is I, I never been on Facebook. I never. And I have very few friends, and the ones that are are usually my law professors, a couple of friends from law school, a couple of high school friends, family, and that's about it. And one of my law professors, who's, uh, who's a wonderful person, he was my uh, contracts professor, Professor Green. And he was the first uh, African-American professor the school hired. And just a really neat guy. He was a young guy. He's only about maybe 10 years older than I am. So he was relatively young as a, as a law school professor. And he, he ended up uh, posting something on Facebook about the riots. He's, as you would expect, about as left-leaning liberal as they could possibly get for a Southern California law professor. Um, I was pretty much the, uh, the, the person in law school that nobody liked because everybody was of one political, uh, do I not need this now? Oh yeah, or, you should do it for the rest um, of it, it, I was the one that was, was not of the similar political affiliation of just about everyone in my class. And he posted great speech on George Floyd and uh, Floyd George, he said, and he said, and it was, um, Everybody needs to vote. And so I said, yes, that's exact. Yeah, you don't burn your neighborhood down, by the way. You, you actually vote. It's amazing people can get out to burn down a neighborhood, but they can't seem to get out to vote for somebody. Uh, it's amazing. And we now live in a country where you will go to jail if you go to church, but if you burn a church down, no problem. Nobody comes and gets you. Uh, I don't know how we got there, but we're, we're there right now. Um, and so I put, yes, you should vote. And somebody put in there, throw all the stupid Republicans out of office and just vote Democrat. And, and, and of course, I made the mistake of saying, well, I'm going to vote. You know, I think that's right. I think everybody needs to vote. And I'm going I'm to vote for President Trump again like I did in 2016. Wow. There were things people called me. I had to look up. I'd never heard some of those words before. I was like, what, is, what does that mean? And then, and then I thought, wow, that's my mom you just said that about. That was weird. Uh, it was horrible. Absolutely horrible. And, and uh, Professor Green sent back to me. He said, you know, that's your prerogative to vote for who you want. I wish you had a party and a candidate that didn't work so hard to deny the right to vote to people of color. Oh, and, I, and I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, hang on a minute now, because let's, let's just go down a little, little memory lane here for irony. When the 13th Amendment was ratified, every Democrat voted against it. When the 15th Amendment was ratified, every Democrat voted against it. When the 19th Amendment was ratified, almost every Democrat voted against it. However, the Democrat Party is the party of black people and women. How does that work? They voted against your right to vote. They just simply didn't think you were smart enough or whatever, so they just said, no, nah, you're just not going to do it. Now I voted against it. And now they're the party of women. And now the Republican Party is just a bunch of old guys that hate people of color and women. I don't know how that happened, but it did. So I sent that to Professor Green. My party, with a question mark, and I put that in there, and your party's the one that voted against all this. And he fired back with the same thing they always fire back, which, which is 1960 and Richard Nixon. That's what they always go to. And they said, that's true. But the, but, but the parties changed. They, they flipped in 1960. 
No, they didn't. Because if you go back and you actually look in history, which is what I kind of told one of the guys that was posting, if you go back, it's, it's less than 1% of all Democrats who voted against every civil rights legislation, the 13th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, all of it. Less than 1% switched over from the Democrat Party to the Republican Party. It's the great lie. That's the great lie that they tell. Is they just say, well, we just didn't do that. That was you guys. And the media helps to get that message out. And for the last 60 years, it's worked. Because people actually believe this. And I sent that, and this guy sent back and said, you know, you shouldn't open your mouth. You sound like an idiot. And I thought... <laughs> Well, I'm on Facebook, I typed it, and I didn't say anything, so. But I also sent back and said, well, that's actually history. I said, maybe you should spend less time on Facebook and on social media, and more time actually reading a book before you pop off with something ignorant, like I, like, I don't know what I'm talking about. And that was pretty much the end. He didn't respond after that. He probably went out and burned down a liquor store or something. I don't know. And, and, and you know, I've told people for years, you know, we live in a constitutional republic, and people like to say, we live in a democracy. No, we don't. That is, that, is, that is incorrect. Again, go get a book, get off of Twitter. Go get a book and read it. We live in a constitutional republic, and a constitutional republic is governed by law. If anybody wants to know what a pure democracy looks like, it's on right there live TV for the last eight, nine, ten days. That's what democracy looks like. Because a democracy is run by emotion. A pure democracy is nothing but emotion. When something happens and they don't like it, everybody freaks out and they can't control themselves. President Trump won an election in 2016. That was, by the way, his big thing that he did that everybody hates. He won. And nobody thought he would. And he won. And what happened? They're burning down stores on Cal Berkeley's campus, which... I'm not losing any sleep over that. If anybody's ever been to Berkeley, uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, talk about a sore thumb. I had out of place when you go there. But they, they, they threw things through windows. They burned stuff down. They attacked people. And then what did they say? We need to abolish the Electoral College. What are you, what are you doing? I was on the phone with... Uh, with the Speaker of the House a couple weeks ago, they were putting a bill forward, and one of the representatives called me, said, I have the Speaker of the House here. So I said, hi, Rusty. Said, I know Rusty and I go way back. He said, hi, Brad. He said, I have a question for you. And I said, what? And he said, I need to know what the constitutionality of what we're trying to do. And I said, uh, if your argument is that it's unconstitutional, you're wrong. It's not. It, in fact, it's it's quite constitutional. And the bill originally passed the Senate 30 to 0. It failed in the House 37 to 23. And my rep called me afterwards and said, I stood up in caucus, and Brenda knows how those caucuses can go. And that's where everybody eats their own, by the way. It's uh, wonderful. And he stood up and he said why he was going to vote against it. And there were a few of them. We had a couple, one from up here where you guys are because they split. There's, there's two different legislative districts for Gila County. And so it was one of my legislators from the southern part. It was one of your legislators from up here. They were sending me text messages. Give me two paragraphs on what I can say to these people in the caucus. I got it. We got to change their mind. So I sent him, him you know, Representative uh, Thorpe a couple of questions and then Representative Cook did the same thing and I sent him stuff and Representative Cook stood up in caucus and said, you know, I just, uh, just talked to Mr. Beauchamp and, and, and if that guy's gonna tell me it's not unconstitutional, then I'm just gonna believe him because if you haven't heard him discuss the Constitution, you should. And I, and which I thought was really neat when he told me that. I thought, why, did you really say that? He said, yes. He said, and he said, and at that moment is when the Speaker of the House said, let's get him on the phone. And so they walked out of caucus and they called me and I said, you guys are wrong. I said, the, the way it's being portrayed is completely wrong. And it failed, 37, 23, it didn't pass. Um, and that's how you do it. You, you don't go burn a store down. In 2008, President Obama was elected. And I always tell people, don't, don't call him Obama. He's President Obama. I didn't vote for him twice. 
but he was still my president because I'm an American. That's how that works. He's my president. He's not the one I picked. He's the guy I got stuck with. Nonetheless, he still runs the country. And I tell this to people because a lot of people called him just Obama. And there was a lot of Republicans that, in all the years I've been doing this, that said, he's not my president. And then President Trump's elected. And what do you hear? You hear the other side say, it's not my president. Where do you live that he's not your president? Um, and, and so I always, you, 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 look, I didn't vote for him, but you respect the office. The man was the president of the United States. I agreed with virtually nothing that he did, um, with the exception of capturing uh, Osama bin Laden and, and, uh, and getting him. That was the, that was the big moment. Uh, that was the one time I can remember in eight years where I went, all right. The rest of the time I did a lot of shaking my head and rubbing my forehead, just wondering, what are we doing? But we lost. The Republican Party lost in eight, and we lost in 12. And you know what we didn't do? Burn anything to the ground. We just kind of looked at it and went, huh. Oh, we got to find somebody better. I don't know how that happened. And then in 2012, it, we, we lost again, and we all went, huh. Well, it's going to be somebody new after this one, so that's good. And then they paraded out uh, Mrs. Clinton. And um, wow, uh, I, I remember thinking, Oh, I please, I hope we're, we're, I'm not going to do another how that happened moment. And, and thankfully, we didn't. But I, but I asked Professor Green in a, separate, in a separate little Facebook exchange, I said, tell me how the Republican Party is preventing people of color from voting. Tell me how this is happening. Because up until 1964, that actually happened. And that's your poll tax amendment. When they passed the amendment to eliminate poll tax, how that worked was I went to vote. And it was usually in the South. That's, that's where a lot of that still, still resonated from. Poll tax. And you'd go and, and, and your poll tax would be, you know, five bucks. It went to school, it went to school textbooks. Co correct. In Texas they did. And when they wanted to keep people that they didn't want to vote out, they just made their tax considerably more than everybody else's. And they couldn't afford it. So they couldn't vote. And that's, and that's why that amendment's in there. And that's why, that's why we passed the poll tax. It was ratified in 1964. And that's what we did. You have to eliminate that. Because that's not right. That's just not right. But I always tell everybody, you know, when you look back in history and you look back at, you know, the two parties, and you were talking about the statues that they're pulling down, um, when, you, when you look at it, what we have now is not any different than what you had back in... The 1860s, it's 1870s, 18, it's no different. Antifa is the military arm of the Democrat Party. The KKK was the militant arm of the Democrat Party. See, the great, the great lie is that the KKK was out hanging hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of, of black people in the South, and that's not it. They only went after and hanged the ones that were trying to get the other ones to vote. That's who they went after. You went after the person that was trying to organize so that they would come out and you wanted to prevent them from voting. And that's what they were doing. Tell me how Antifa is any different. If you have a differing opinion, it's just violence immediately. If you try to, if you try to march, if you try to have a counterpoint, it's just violence immediately. Um, I had a couple people in my office the other day that said, what are you going to do if those protesters and rioters, the people who are rioting, come from Phoenix and come to Globe? And all I could think is, oh, I hope that doesn't happen. Because Globe's a mining town. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, there's a lot of things you learn in life, and one of them is don't do something stupid in a mining town. Because that, that, that does not end well for you. Globe, Superior, Morency, not smart. And somebody said, what will happen? And I said, it'll look like that movie, The Hills Have Eyes. <laughs> they'll come into town, they'll start rioting in Broad Street, and the people will come out of their houses and bum rush downtown, and they will seal it off, and now you can't leave. And then, then the violence will start. Then you'll see some fist fighting going on. And, and it won't end until, it won't end, and you won't get to run away. And I said, I, I really hope they don't come out, but if they do... Wow, I think that's going to put an end to any of the rioting. They'll put that on Fox News and everybody will go, oh, don't go there. Um, if they stopped in Superior on their way into town, they wouldn't make it to town because Superior is exactly the same way. 
And they said, well, what do you do if, if, if people loot? Because right now people were, they were looting. They're burning buildings to the ground. They're shooting people. And they said, what do you do? And I said, well, I prosecute them. And they said, well, what do you do with everybody who simply breaks the curfew? I said, you prosecute them. That's how it stops. Mm-hmm. You know, my, my dad, God rest his soul, used to always tell me, son, you're not, you don't learn from your mistakes. There, that's not the whole, the, there, there's more to the sentence. You don't learn from your mistakes. You learn from the consequences of your mistakes. And he would say, you made a mistake. The consequence was, I gave you a smack upside the head. Look what you never did again. Yeah, that stupid thing. It works. Because it's the consequences. And when you go out and you violate curfew, and there are no consequences, you know what you do the next night? You're just back out violating curfew. When you break into a liquor store and you steal everything, you know what you do the next night? You find another liquor store, or a Target, or whatever's on the list of things you'd like to do. One of my friends said, I can't believe that they went to Scottsdale. How does that happen? I said, Scottsdale has all these expensive shops. And they went in and just looted the place. And they said, what would you do? And I said, if they burned a building down, I'd put them in prison for as long as the law would absolutely allow. That'd be my argument. Whether the judge does or not would have been up to him. But if they broke windows, if they stole anything, that's going to happen. You know, unfortunately, I, in, in my job, I have to make decisions, and sometimes they're not popular with everyone. And I understand that. But I get to make that decision. You get to sleep well at night knowing that you didn't have to make that decision. You get to just relax and go, wow, man, I'm glad that guy had to do it. Um, a case in point is when that family drove through Tunnel Creek. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. I made a decision that's not real happy with our friends to the east up here. Because that's where those people were from. They're not real happy with me. But everybody that else that came up to me said, man, I'm glad I didn't have to make that decision. Wow, I can't believe you had to do that. But every one of them said, we're glad you're there because that was the right decision to make. I'm not happy about it. It's terrible. It was not easy to make, but I had to make the decision. Because if there's no consequences, it never stops. And what happened? Those three children died. A week later, another guy drove through and died. Two weeks after that, another person drove through and they had to come and rescue him. It, I don't know what people are thinking. They are. Um, and that's exactly right. We stopped thinking. We started letting emotion run rampant and cognitive thought is out the window. We just don't think about what we're doing. We don't think of the consequences of our actions. People used, I, used to do, uh, I used to do landlord-tenant law when I was in private practice. And I worked for a property management company. And they did the government housing. And so I evicted people who were in government housing that had no, no money. And I had a lot of them wait for me in the parking lot. And they'd say, you know, you just made my family homeless. And I would say, no, sir, you did when you were selling marijuana out of your house in violation of your lease. I didn't do anything. You did. What you're actually asking me to do is care more about your family than you did. That's what you're asking me to do. I don't even know your family, and you want me to care about more about them than you do. Um, but if it makes you feel better, you can blame me. That's okay. I just, I'm going to be fine when I drive home. Uh, mostly because I pay my bills. It's always good when you pay your bills. You kind of get to breathe easy. It's kind of nice. When you don't pay your bills, you're always wondering what's going to happen. How much time do you want for Q&A? I don't, we, we can do it now, anytime you want. Anybody's got questions, okay. just... Uh, we have until half past. Yeah, just fire away. I know because I have another meeting at 9 o'clock. i got to do what he's doing out there, only it's for football. Yeah. It's a football Zoom meeting. I don't know how you coach football from a Zoom meeting, but we're... <laughs> that, you know, you got to play the hand you're dealt, so that's just how it works. We can reshuffle. Yeah, I'd like to. What are we going to do after Trump? I don't know. You got to start looking for some. Well, the, the 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 funny thing is 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 when you look back in history, your your good presidents come from the governor's offices or come from the House of Representatives. They they rarely come from the U.S. Senate. Uh, John F. Kennedy was one, and then of course President Obama was was a uh, was another one. Um, and so usually it's your governors. So if you're looking for somebody for after Trump. You, you're probably looking at a governor somewhere. 
is, is probably what you're going to be looking at. But I don't know how much of a backbone he has. Who's that? Pence, the vice president. Um, you know, it's, it's, funny you, it's funny actually you say that. Is in my job when I promote people, the county likes to promote everybody who's been there the longest. Yeah. That's, that's not a good idea, if you're wondering. That's not. Just because you've been doing a job for 30 years doesn't mean you're terribly good at it. Right. It also doesn't mean you're good at leading other people in the job. Uh, one really has nothing to do with the other. And so um, I promoted a lady in my office, and she'd been there for nine years. And two other women in the office had been there for 22. And they said, how is that possible? And I said, you, you possess zero leadership skill. You know, you know your job, but you do not inspire others to get behind you. If we were landing at Omaha Beach and the little door on the Higgins boat is dropping, you'd be the officer in the back going, all right, boys, let's go. Let's go get that. Come on, I'm going to wait here. I need somebody who's going to be right there with all of them running up there. Um, and so that's what I always tell everybody. You're, you, just, you just don't have that ability to inspire people to storm a beachhead. It's just not there. Um, you're a great employee. You're just not a leader. And so when you say Mike Pence, I don't know if he, has a, if he has the backbone for it. Some people are really good as the number two guy. Some people are really good as the number two guy. I've been, I've been an assistant coach in high school football and high school baseball for 25 years. And I've had dozens of programs say, would you like to be a head coach? And I tell them all, no thanks, I'm real happy being the number two guy. I'm the bad guy. But then the number two guy never does a press conference. <laughs> it's nice. When it really goes bad and they look at me, I go, oh, the head coach is over there. <laughs> I'll take care of the team. And you send them off to go get them. And so when you talk about Pence, I, I don't know. I don't know if he's got the back. I think he's a heck of a vice president. Yeah. Uh, but he might not be that guy that, again, ins you know, inspires you. Okay, we have Kevin back here. All right. Uh, uh. I was listening when the when the looting started, and people started feeling um, uh, that they weren't safe, and of course, America's arming themselves big time. I couldn't believe, I was reading an article, and I can't remember which politician was saying yep. this. They were making it that if somebody loose comes into your house and you shoot them, we're the bad guy. <laughs> What's your response on that? Uh, we're not. The bad guy. Uh, if you come into my home to steal my stuff or to really to harm me, because we have the we have the we have the, the the castle doctrine basically in Arizona, we don't have to retreat from our own home. So once they come into your home and they're going to do harm to you, um, have at it. They were actually trying to say we didn't have a right to protect ourselves. Well, in some states you don't. Some states are like that. Some states they they don't have that. Um, but we have stand your ground law. They call it. It's the Castle Doctrine. When you're when you're in when you're in law school, it's generally called the Castle Doctrine. In Arizona, it's called the Stand Your Ground. You don't have to retreat from your home. If I'm in my home and you start to chop through my door with an axe, you're going to get about one step into my house before you die of a lot of lead poisoning, because that's what's going to happen. Imported from China. Well, what states do you work? Imported from China. Guys, come on, one question each. What states do you work in? Um, is one of them. Cal California's one of them that it's, it's, real, it's real scary. It's real scary when you're in California. You're supposed to just call the police. And if you live in Minneapolis, you won't be able to do that for very much longer if those people have their way. But in Arizona, you can, uh, you can, use, uh, you can use deadly force to protect yourself, certainly in your own home. Absolutely. I have a special Thompson submachine gun like the old mobsters from the 20s had with a 50-round drug magazine. I always joke with people and say, well, you're chopping through the door. I'm going to put my fedora on because I'm going to look good when I get you. When you come through, I'm going to dress for it. Okay, Alejandra. Uh, yes, question. How do you deal with the ACLU? Oh, I try not to. <laughs> oh. You know, again, that's an, it's another organization that, that really is just, is just run by emotion. Um, you, you know, some of the claims they made. I went to, I went to law school in 1999 is when, I, is when I attended law school. I was the valedictorian of my graduating class at, at Northern Arizona University. 
and I couldn't get into a bunch of law schools. Because if you go and get a, get a college brochure, just go online and send away for one and have them mail it to you. Within the first couple of pages, they will discuss their ethnic diversity. That's what they're proud of. They're proud of that. I, I personally, I would run a university of, I'm going to hire, I'm going to get the best person. I'm going to get the most qualified. Uh, if I owned a business, I'm going to get the people that are the, mo that are the best workers. I don't care what color you are. You've got three arms, one of them growing out of your head. If you do the job better than everybody else, I'm hiring you. Right. Unfortunately, not a lot of people think that way. Um, you still run into problems. But affirmative action, in my opinion, affirmative action is it, if you're hiring somebody because of their color, you're no different than not hiring somebody because of their color. Color is what is driving your decision. And you should be colorblind, certainly when you own a business. The only color you should be thinking about is green, because that's the color the money's printed. Unless you get hundreds, sir, those are blue now. And do, I don't think we needed to make Ben Franklin's head any bigger either. Uh, <laughs> Another question? Yeah. Um, oh, I just want now, to, tonight before you leave, I would like you to look at my phone. We got the three manufacturer of jewelry over in LA. And during the, the, the unforeseen lives that happened, I have a picture of our employees, and they're all holding guns, and they're out in front of the building. Mm -hmm. The building across the street is no longer there. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, they got a bunch of crap for defending it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's just amazing. I, well, I'll show it to you. But here are right about 22 guys that came out with security holding a lot of firepower, and, and, and off they went. And we got a um, correspondent needing to give an attorney form over there because there was a question about why they had so much gunpowder in the mm -hmm. store. Well, that's easy. Did you see how many people are burning everything to the ground? Oh. I wish I still had all my contact information for everybody I went to law school with, because I'd like to be able to say, now this is why 20 years ago I said you need to have a 30-round magazine. Yeah. Now, see, now if you want to understand it, just look at how many people come to loot your store. Look at how many come to burn your building to the ground. If you want to demonstrate, demonstrate. That's your right. But, but if you read it, you have the right to peacefully assemble. Nothing's peaceful about burning a store to the ground or looting or shooting people or, or anything like that. But you have the right to peaceful assembly. When I had a professor in school in my history class, we were talking about Kent State. And uh, he said, you know, that was a peaceful assembly. And I said, tell me what part of peaceful was when they were burning the ROTC building to the ground. Arson, by definition, is not peaceful. Yes, sir. You mentioned about the castle doctrine. So when people are looting and they're stealing stuff, running out the store, why aren't the police there and say, stop, you're stealing stuff, stop or I'll shoot, and shoot them. You shoot the first 15 or 20, and the rest of them will get the hint. Why can't we do that? Well, he, I'm starting a small war. That's what you'll start. That's what you'll start. Because law enforcement, you know, again, deadly force, and I asked a lot of police officers, um, that question, we had, a, we had an individual down in Globe who was shot and killed by a police officer early in the morning of New Year's Eve. So it was December 31st, but it was like 1 o'clock in the morning. And he had come after the officer with a knife. And the officer retreated and told him, drop it, drop it, stop, stop, stop. And just keeps giving ground and giving ground. Well, when somebody with a knife gets within a certain range, they're going to get you. And once he got to that, 21 feet is if you don't know they have a knife and your gun is in your holster, at 21 feet they can get you before you can get your gun out and get them. And this kid was about five feet away and the officer shot him. And he went down and he got up and he started coming after him again and that's when he shot him about nine more times. Um, well, we did that. But, but when you do that, you, 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 the, the doctrine that law enforcement has is you use non-lethal force when faced with a non-lethal threat. You use lethal force when you're faced with a lethal threat. Running out of a jewelry store is not a lethal threat. You can't just, you can't, but if they're running at you with a baseball bat, now, now you have your argument. And law enforcement's held to that standard. I know that we all don't think so because everybody's burning buildings to the ground thinking that that's not true, but it is. Um, every officer involved shooting in the county comes to my office for me to review, and I'll determine whether they acted appropriately. 
Um, they've all acted appropriately, by the way. We've had, quite, we've had a few of them in town, and they've all acted appropriately, but you can't do that. Um, I joked with my brother and I said, I'd just line everybody up like the old Civil War and just march them out through with 58 caliber muskets and just fire one volley and everybody goes home after that. <laughs> and he laughed and he goes, yeah, we can't do that. I said, I know, but nothing breaks up a riot like a good organized bayonet charge, I told him. <laughs> okay, okay. So when I Jim, was younger, make it short because we've got less than I thought minutes. if we were in trouble causing mischief, and the police come up to us and said, stop, and we took off running, I would expect that they might shoot me. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> I, mean, I know, but, well, but back have. then, you had that more mm -hmm. authority, you know, you respected mm -hmm. the authority that much more. Yes. And, uh, but the other thing is, too, is I think a lot of people get confused between the two terms of liberty and uh, equality. Mm -hmm. And what the French Revolution had, they wanted to profess equality, we talk about liberty. That's a huge difference. Now, how'd that French Revolution work out for them? <laughs> Not well, if you did, again, if you're that guy on Facebook that doesn't read, doesn't turn out well at the end. Um, I always love watching movies with people and it's a historical movie and then it ends like a bunch of people when Titanic came out said, I can't believe the boat sank. Where, where, where have you been? <laughs> what did you think was going to happen? They were going to float off on a door to the South Pacific and live happily ever after? No, the boat sinks. Braveheart, by the way, spoiler alert, William Wallace dies. They get him at the end. That's how that ends. That's how that happened. Um, and I, I always laugh when people say stuff like that because it's just ridiculous. It's like, oh my God, you really, people really don't read, do you? Okay, this is the very last question. I get it. Um, would you be willing to go down to the Department of Education at some point? Because you've been a history teacher and lobby for getting a way better civic program into the schools than we do have now. The problem with a way better, the way better civics program you're actually asking them to do is just actually teach the truth. Uh, that always helps when you're going to teach history. Actually teach what, real, what happened. Um, and we don't do that. And, and you, you talked about how they're pulling the statues down. What do we do in 200 years when nobody's around to remember those statues? That history's gone forever. You just, I'm going to etch it on my tombstone. There you go. You just, you just can't simply do that. When I, was in, when, I, when I taught junior high school, I'll give you one story really quick on teaching the truth and how it gets you in trouble. One, I taught the Holocaust to my high school class and almost got fired because one, one of the school board members said there's no evidence that that happened. Um, and, then, and then when I was in junior high, I, taught, I, I was teaching how, how, how you vote for president because it was 96 and everybody said, who do you vote for for president? And when an eighth grader's class asks you that, that's awesome. You just want to put the lesson plan away and run with that for a day. And I did. My problem is I told them the truth. Then I went to the teacher's lounge. They were waiting for me like it was an ambush. They were just so angry with me. And they said, you're teaching kids to be Republicans. I said, no, I'm just teaching them both sides and letting them choose. And they said, just once we want you to teach them something a Democrat did that everybody knows. I said, all right, come in tomorrow. And it was the sixth grade staff. So on their prep, they came into the back of my room and watched, and the principal came in there too. And I went up to the chalkboard and I drew a little road and a dip and a bridge and some water and a car and a car going off and a car sinking to the bottom and a little stick man swimming to the surface and running off in the trees. And the sad part of that story is when I turned around, only the principal knew what I was about to say. And I was 25 years old. And I'm looking at these, these female teachers that are in their 50s. They were alive when this happened. And they're just sitting there like, what's he going to talk about? And the principal's looking at me like a junior high girl watching a horror movie. He's just looking through his fingers. He's like, I can't believe this is about to happen. I said, kids, today we're going to learn how Democrat Senator Ted Kennedy killed his secretary, Mary Jo Kopechny, when he left her in a submerged vehicle and didn't tell anybody till the following Sunday morning at a little place called Chappaquiddick. And everybody just, all those teachers turned as red as your jacket. They just went absolutely insane. And the kids said, well, he went to jail, didn't he? No, you don't go to jail. You're a Kennedy. Let me spell it. And I put it on the board. And I said, when you're a Kennedy, you can kill your secretary. You can wait, rape women on your compound. I said, in fact, you can even run liquor for the mob. But wait, we'll do that next week. Next week, we'll learn how Papa Kennedy earned the Kennedy fortune 
which happened to do with running liquor during prohibition, which was what amendment? You always have the one kid in your room. I had this one kid the first day of school. He comes up to me and says, I read all the amendments in the back of the book. Proud of you. Who does that? You're 13. Go kick a ball. I mean, we can do this later. Um, and, and that kid, of course, I said, and what amendment is that? And the kid, 18. That kid knew. He put his hand up. I said, that's right. And I left, and they were going to fire me. All those teachers said, we're going to the school board to fire you. And the beauty of that story is, is I told the principal when he said they want to fire you, is I said, I don't even work here. I'm doing my student teaching. I'm not even employed by the district. <laughs> You're going to have to call Northern Arizona University, explain what I just taught, explain to them how it's incorrect, and that you fired me from a job I really don't have. <laughs> and he just stared at me. I said, not to mention... We play Globe and football next week. I really don't think you want that rivalry, the coach not being on the field. I don't know, it could just be me. And he said, yeah, I'll make it go away. But I got like a month of punitive bus duty. I had to be the teacher out there at 7 o'clock in the morning. And my philosophy on that is, is if you're 14 years old and you can't get out of the way of a giant yellow bus that's loud going five miles an hour, how bad really is that? I mean, how do, you, how do you miss them? They're huge. Um, so I would stand out there all the time. And so when you ask about civics, that's, that's what you'll run into. We don't teach the truth. In my textbooks as a kid, I can remember, because we were talking about you, you know, uh, African Americans and somebody talked about how them coming over was better for them. There was a picture of a guy sitting in a net, and it was an African man in a net on the beach. And the caption read, he was sold into slavery from, him, from another tribe. Some of the tribes, people don't realize that. You know, a lot of the slaves actually voluntarily went into it to get out of debt in their home country, to their home tribe. They did it. And, it was, and he was there waiting to be picked up. That picture is not in your textbooks anymore for kids. They don't, we don't teach that part anymore. But you were really, I just want to, brief, just really quick, you were talking about how you know, they, they, they're better than where they, you know, the African Americans are better than where they were. You know, it, the funny thing is, I had a young man who worked for me, he was an attorney, and he was from Trinidad. Really neat kid, I wish I still had him. He left and he didn't want to go, uh, but he had to because his wife wanted to move, and I said, yeah, that's your first boss, you got to go do what she says. But neat kid, and he told me one day, he said, you know what's funny? He said, when you look at the history of slavery, it's viewed completely different in the Caribbean than it is in America. And I said, how so? And he said, your, your Africans in the Caribbean are grateful for the sacrifice that, that, that you know, sometimes was not voluntary, that, that, their, that their ancestors made for them, that their, that their families made generations ago to provide them the opportunity to live in a better place in the Caribbean versus where they came from, and to be able to be something, to be able to actually get more out of life. And he said, and in America, it's the opposite. They just complain all the time. And this comes from an African American kid. And he said, I don't understand it, and no one in the Caribbean does. And I thought that was amazing that when you think of it that way, make their sacrifice noteworthy. Make something positive come out of one of the most horrific things people can do to other people instead of just continuing to perpetrate the negativity of which is how they live now, and I just don't understand it. It wasn't all a brutal system. I no. just read a little bit about Jefferson Davis. When he freed his slaves later on, they actually whipped. And when he mm -hmm. went to Richmond to be the president, they were, they were sad that he was leaving. Mm -hmm. now, that's the only story I know about it, but they, they weren't all beaten and abused. No, you actually used the Irish for that if you wanted to know the truth. When there was dangerous work that had to be done in the South, your, your plantation owners, when they had to clear a swamp, they went and they hired Irish, and they brought them in from, from New York, from the north, Northeastern, and they brought them in to do that work because if they get eaten by a gator or bit by a cottonmouth and they die, you're out of day's wages. And that's the way they looked at it. And, and yeah, so you're, you're more dangerous work, believe it or not, that they, they did that. That was the Irish that got that one. So uh, I guess it didn't pay to be Irish back then. All right. There you go. Yay, Bradley. Okay. So we thank you so very much. You're welcome. I got to go now. I got my football. I don't know how I'm going to coach a secondary.